Episode 16, Visualization. Meditation, focused attention, and prayer have all been part of life since we began. The more modern concept of visualization caught on around the beginning of the 20th century and skyrocketed popularity with the baby boom generation. The core fundamentals are similar that focuses mental energy that will produce what you concentrate on. Again, we become what we think about. One of the key factors to get where you want to go and become the competent person you want to be is to start acting like you are already that person. Not in the future. Act as if you have arrived already right now. And there's a scientific reason that this really works. Scientists are agreed that the human nervous system is incapable of distinguishing between an actual experience and the same experience imagined vividly and in complete detail. That is, if you can imagine something very strongly as far as your nervous system and its reactions, the event for all practical purposes has actually taken place. The person who worries about something projects himself mentally, emotionally, even physically into a situation that hasn't even occurred. In most instances, he suffers as much or more than had the object of his worry actually taken place. The person who worries intensely about, say, failure of some kind, finds himself undergoing the same reactions that accompany actual failure, feelings of anxiety, inadequacy, and humiliation, as well as the corresponding physical symptoms, headache, an upset or painful stomach. As far as his mind and body are concerned, he has failed. And if he worries about it long enough, if he concentrates on failure hard enough, he will upset himself to the extent that he will actually bring about the failure he dreads. But while this coin has this destructive and painful side, it also has the reverse side. Using this inability on the part of the nervous system to distinguish between fact and fantasy, the imagination can be used to build a powerful and prevailing force for achievement and success. The mind and nervous system form a marvelous and complex agency of enormous power. They form an agency analogous to the electric computer in that they can only act on the data we feed into them. And just as the person who worries about failure unwittingly defeats himself, the same time and energy concentrating on the success he seeks, a worthy goal toward which he can positively direct his efforts, marshals all his forces to work for him instead of against him. We will, therefore, tend to become in real life exactly like the image we habitually hold of ourselves. This is why Lincoln was so right when he said, people are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. They are also as successful or unsuccessful or anything else. Knowing this, it pays to check our self-image from time to time. Is the image we hold of ourselves the sort that will lead us to where we want to go and what we want to do? Is it a healthy, forward-going image? Is it an image of strength and accomplishment? A good device to use to help build such an image of yourself, if you think the one you've got could stand some improvement, is to imagine that you are the central figure, the only figure for the most part, in a motion picture that is to be used as a documentary of your life. In all of your acts, those that relate to the way you do your work and get along with others, how you appear to the world, act the part as would the person you would most like those you love and respect to see on this picture. As the central figure of such a picture, you would dress with more care, take more pains with your appearance. You'd have a better posture, you'd smile a great deal more, and you'd be more thorough in your work. Act the part of the person you would most like to be. Play the part as you would the lead in a play, and then one day the image you project to the world and hold of yourself will be exactly what you want it to be. In an earlier episode, we addressed being average or being normal. Earl has more to say on this topic as it is important to visualize a higher path. We're under an unspoken but enormous pressure to be average. Yet I wonder if you conducted a survey and asked 5,000 adults if it's their aim in life to be average, how many would reply yes? Would you? Would you be satisfied with an average education and an average income for the rest of your life? So even though most people really don't want to be average, they've got these grooves of habit they spent 20 or more years forming that makes them keep playing the world's most unrewarding game. The name of the game is Follow the Follower. This is why, as adults, we should go back to that empty lot with a deeply worn path through it, using it as the symbol of our tendency to blindly follow without question and plow it up. Turn over every bit of soil on that lot, and then smooth it out and build something on it more noteworthy than a path. 
or at least make a new path, an original path. Of one thing we can be absolutely certain, if we follow anyone long enough, we've got to end where he takes us. In some cases, this might be great, but it's worth thinking about. It's worth checking our references. We should never make the mistake of thinking that because a great number, even a great majority of people, are doing things a certain way, that it's necessarily the best way. History just doesn't bear this out. The pressure to be average and normal can have a major impact on your character and how you deal with others. Earl has more on what being normal means to your character in upcoming episodes. For now, on our topic of visualization, focusing on the life you want will release your positive energy, and Earl explains why. People frequently say of someone, I don't know where he gets his energy. He's going all the time. Have you ever wondered why some people seem to have more energy than others? Why some people seem to get so much done in so short a time? Well, I've got the answer for you. The answer is desire. That's right. The amount of energy you use will always be in exact proportion to how much you want something. Arnold Bennett put it this way. He wrote, Perhaps you've been hoping to create energy in yourself. Now, you cannot create energy, either in yourself or elsewhere. Nobody can. You can only set energy free, loosen it, transform it, direct it. An individual is born with a certain amount of energy, no more. And what is more important, you cannot put additional quantities into him. You may sometimes seem to be putting energy into him, but you're not. You're simply setting his original energy free, applying a match to the coal or fanning the fire. Some individuals appear to lack energy when, as a fact, they're full of energy, which is merely dormant, waiting for the match or waiting for direction. The usual idea of the amount of energy possessed by an individual is the intensity of the desire of that individual. It is desire that uses energy. Strong desires generally betoken much energy, and they're definite desires. Without desires, energy is rendered futile. Nobody will consume energy in action unless he desires to perform the action, either for itself or as a means to a desired end. You must not confuse vague, general aspirations with desire. A real desire is definite, concrete. The desire which indicates great energy is always there, worrying. It is an obsession. It is a nuisance. It is a whip or a scorpion. It has no mercy. So, as Arnold Bennett wrote, your energy can be measured by the degree of your desire for something. A good example of this is when you're looking forward to an evening out. It can be a party, the theater, anything, but... If it's something you want very much to do, you'll find even after a hard day as you dress to go out, you're full of energy. Normally, you'd be ready for a deep chair in a paper or bed. So, if you find yourself without energy all the time, dragging around, or, or most of the time, particularly as it pertains to your work, it's time to re-evaluate what you're working for or toward. The teenager who can barely move through the house without collapsing in a chair or walks as though he's coated with two inches of lead and who shambles off to school in the morning looking for all the world as though he might never make it is a totally different person on the football field or the basketball court or when it comes to getting dressed for a date. Desire is the answer. Somehow desire knows how to tap the reservoir of energy that is in each of us and withdraw enough for its satisfaction. The higher the desire, the more energy we will find we have. And if you want to be filled with energy, bubbling over with it, find something to work toward that's bigger than you are, that so fills you with challenge and interest, you're jealous of the sleep that takes you away from it. This is the best of all. Goethe wrote, the great German philosopher, he wrote, Energy will do anything that can be done in the world, and no talents, no circumstances, no opportunities will make a two-legged animal a man without it. Your desire and energy you feel from it will drive you to the goals you choose. The important consideration as a competent winner is knowing what you want. A very wise man once said, if you can tell me what you want, I can tell you how to get it. Now the reason he was a very wise man is because he knew that the problem with people is not their ability to achieve what they want, but rather their general inability to decide on what they want. Have you ever thought much about this? It is estimated that the great majority of people who are dissatisfied with their lives, who feel the world is passing them by, that they're not getting anywhere, are not suffering from a lack of ability. Far from it. They're suffering from not having decided upon what it is they want out of life. Now, it stands to reason that if we don't know where we're going, we can't get anywhere, right? Right. So, as the wise man once said, if you can tell me what you want, I can tell you how to get it. As William James, the father of American psychology and great Harvard professor, put it, if you would be rich, you will be rich. If you would be good, you will be good. If you would be learned, you will be learned. But wish then for one thing exclusively, 
and not for a hundred other incompatible things just as strongly. So the secret to achievement is to decide upon one thing you want very much. Sure, there are a lot of other things you want too, but one at a time. Write down all the things you want, and then pick the one, just one, that you want more than the rest. Then stick with that one thing until it's achieved. Then go on to the next item, on the agenda, and so forth. A man following this course of action can accomplish more in five years than the average individual accomplishes in forty, all because the average never seems to make the one decision that would give direction and purpose to his life. Now, a person might say, I don't know what I want. All right. But the longer you put off the decision, the longer you put off getting anywhere or anything. A gentleman by the name of Bulwer put it this way. He wrote, The man who seeks one and but one thing in life may hope to achieve it. But he who seeks all things, wherever he goes, only reaps from the hopes which he sows a harvest of barren regrets. Well, this is the whole point. Seek one thing, not two or more, one thing at a time. The next question that comes up is the one which goes, How do I know I have the ability to achieve that which I seek? The answer to that is, we don't want things we don't have the ability to achieve. We all seem to have a built-in governor which keeps us as individuals from wanting things beyond our capability to accomplish. That's why one man sets his heart on becoming a lawyer, why another applies for a job with the Forest Service or in an automobile factory. The wide spectrum of occupations and accomplishments shows us the wide diversity of desires on the part of individuals. You've seen a man working atop the dizzy heights of the steel skeleton of a skyscraper, and you've probably said to yourself, I wouldn't do that for all the money in the world, and you wouldn't. But he enjoys the work and will do it for so much an hour. Have no fear that you can accomplish your goal. It's deciding on the goal that can be the most important decision of your life. It has been written that providence has nothing good or high in store for one who does not resolutely aim at something high or good. A purpose is the eternal condition of success. There's a lot to be said about the positive effects a mentor can have on you. You are fortunate if you know someone in the field that you pursue that will personally mentor you. However, you do not need to personally know the person that embodies the qualities and talents you admire. You can find someone to follow by studying the life of the person. One of the finest things a person can do, man, woman, or child, is to find someone worthy of respect, admiration, and emulation. If this doesn't happen, the chances are good a person will follow the crowd. And, unfortunately, this is the wrong group to follow. They're nice people, but statistics prove they don't know where they're going, and, as a result, they can't get very far. If you follow them, you'll go to the same place. Those who achieve greatness during their lives usually have patterned their lives after some individual for whom they've held great respect and admiration. If you read the great writers, you find them referring to some writer who's gone before them and after whom they've tried to pattern their lives. Now, this doesn't mean they copy them, it simply means they've been inspired to make a similar success of their lives. Now, let's say that instead of doing this, a person lives as do the people up and down the block or the rest of the people at work. This is the easiest of all traps to fall into. Each of us has a natural tendency to think, act, talk, and conduct our lives as do those by whom we're habitually surrounded. And from time to time, we should ask ourselves, are the people I'm emulating going where I want to go? If I act like them, I will naturally have to end up like them. Now, this might be fine, but at least it should be carefully and very objectively examined from time to time. Now, the reason is clear. No two human beings are alike. They're different, with different likes and dislikes, different talents and abilities. Take you, for instance. Have you ever often thought of the fact that you're a marvelous, unique creature, the only one of its kind in the entire universe? I'm not saying this just to make you feel good. It's a proved scientific fact. Now, why should you follow anybody? You should have your own goals, your own schedule of work. You should have in your mind a clear picture of the kind of person you wish to become. If you'll subscribe to the truth that anything can be improved upon, and that as it's improved upon, its value increases, and that this applies to you and me just as it does to anything else, you'll find that this makes a lot of sense. Now, your future is the place in which you're going to spend the rest of your life. What would you like that future to be like? Are you going to decide for yourself or let other people decide it for you. You know, if you sit riding in the back of the wagon with your feet dragging, you've got your back toward your future. Where you go will depend upon the whims or desires of the guy sitting up front driving the team. Now, if that's okay with you, fine. 
but to me it seems like a big risk. Maybe it's time for you to climb up on the seat and take those reins in your own hands. Maybe you don't want to go where the wagon's been heading in the past. Now, this is a decision each of us must make at some time in our lives. Just be sure you pick the right person to follow. We all have people in our past who've shaped us to be who we are today. Take time to evaluate the people who have influenced you in the past and who you want to impact your future. If you patterned your life after a crook, you'd become a crook too, wouldn't you? Sure you would. If you patterned your life after a minister, you'd become a minister. So here's the question you might ask yourself. After whom have I patterned my life? Are they people that I want to be like? Are they going where I want to go? Do they live the way I really want to live? Are they, in fact, worthy of emulation? Can I take my one chance at life and make the most of it by following the people I've been following? Am I playing follow the leader or follow the follower? And just who is the leader in this big circle? Well, here's an interesting experiment you can make on your own. You can go to virtually any neighborhood in any city in the country and you'll find people living in that neighborhood who all live like each other. Same kind of homes, yards, furniture, cars, front doors, picture windows, dogs, you name it. It gives the impression they were stamped on the same press and all came off the end of the same assembly line. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this necessarily, but it deserves some thought. The same thing applies to any neighborhood, from the top to the bottom. Makes no difference. We tend to conduct our lives as do those with whom we habitually associate. Youngsters who are raised in a wealthy neighborhood just naturally take it for granted and grow up into largely the same kind of people, living in the same sort of neighborhood in which they were raised. This also applies to a depressed area. Without thinking too much about it, the people who live there take that sort of life for granted, assume it to be their lot, and as a general rule, follow along. There is, of course, a steady, slow improvement as society improves generally, Old buildings are torn down, streets and buildings are improved, urban renewal comes into the picture, along with better health and education, but this notwithstanding, the people follow the people who are, in turn, following them. So, ask yourself, who is the person after whom I've patterned my life? As you try to pin this person down, make sure he's the sort of person you really want very much to be like. If you've been going along without thinking too much about it, following people who do not represent your ideal, it might be a good idea to shift, to raise your sights, or even embark on a bold new course of your own. Nicholas Murray Butler once said that people can be placed into three classes. One, the few who make things happen. Two, the many who watch things happen. And three, the overwhelming majority who have no idea what has happened. This applies as much to the business of daily living as it does to human progress or running a successful business. I don't know how you feel on this subject, but I want to know what's going on. And if it's not the way I like it, I'm going to try to change it. How about you? Don't pull the old saw about what can one person do. One person can do a lot. One person is behind everything that happens. At some time and in some place, one person got an idea for a change. You will live, act, think, talk, and conduct yourself in virtually all of your affairs as do those you're emulating. If they represent the sort of person you want to be, fine. If not, find a better model. In the next episode, character. This is Earl Nightingale. Thank you.